This is NBC Nightly News with Kate Snow. Good evening. We have some breaking news that we are just processing here this afternoon. This is all happening in Paris, France. France wants to ramp up border security following the terror attacks here in Paris as Europe's open border policy comes under heavy scrutiny. So two sisters and you're the brother, right? Yeah. Were you always the brother? I'm not always. What were you before? I'm their a sister. How come it changed? Um, because I wanted to be a boy. I know you've explained uh, that Trump was talking about unifying Second Amendment supporters, getting them to the polls to stop Hillary Clinton. We just heard Katie Turr say that the campaign today is calling it a joke. Which is it? I'm Kate Snow reporting from New York. I'll see you tomorrow on MSNBC. This is very fun, I have to say. Uh, uh, that was a face I didn't think I'd have to see for a little while. Miss Katrina Pearson oh. not wearing her uh, Magnum Bullets uh, necklace in that clip. But uh, for those who don't know, she quick was a, what we would call a Trump surrogate. Yeah. She was a spokesperson type for the Trump campaign. Yes. Yeah, that's exact, yeah, that's what she was. <laughs> I'm going to change the subject. I feel not cool enough to be here. I was Why looking at the wall of all the photos on the way in. There are a lot of cool people that have sat up here. You're pretty cool. Okay. You're pretty cool. You've done some amazing work <laughs> while you've been at NBC. Thank and you. before that, you did incredible work. But Thank you. But focusing on the NBC work that you've done, I mean, even just this past year, we were talking about it before. I was watching some of it. You did a massive series on uh, the heroin epidemic in, in this country. You did a, a wonderful series on uh, raising transgender kids. Let's talk about, you know, you're an, you have a show that you anchor on MSNBC, right. and these uh, other projects, these sort of in-depth investigations that you do are generally for the nightly news, right? NBC nightly Yeah, and news. I anchor Sunday nightly news. Right. I'm sure everybody here watches every Sunday night um, yeah when did you start sort of getting the chance to do these in-depth investigations um, I've been doing that for a while I you know I've been in this business about 20 years started in local news and kind of worked my way up through I was at CNN for a while covering Capitol Hill I was at ABC for a while I uh, used to anchor a show called Good Morning America, and now never heard of it. Never heard of it. Now I'm at NBC uh, and have been for almost seven years. I can't believe that six and a half years. Um, and I, I really, from the beginning of my time at NBC, started doing long form, which is what we call kind of more in-depth pieces that last more than a minute and a half. Which is nightly news tends to be minute and a half, two minute pieces. Um, so I started doing some long form stuff, and I started really digging in on topics. And you're right, I. We were talking about it backstage. I really wanted to do, for example, that, that series that we did on opioid addiction, on heroin in particular. And that was kind of, it was already bad, but now, it, that was three years ago. Now it's so much worse. Um, but I love being able to, uh, you know, really get out in the field and dig in on a story and meet the people that are, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of hear about it, but to see, to sit with Jacob, who you just saw in that tape, who's a little boy, who's transgender, to sit with him on the floor of his bedroom and really get to know him and his family is a very different experience. And to be able to tell their stories, that's what I love about this job. Now, I have to ask, you know, hearing their stories and being such a part of the production of, of getting their stories out there, and as you said, nightly news has to be a minute to a minute and a half, and even an in The pieces, yeah. The, pieces. I mean, the full and broadcast even, is 30 minutes, but yeah. <laughs> and even an in-depth investigation has to be sort of set, cut for time and be a sort of a part of a format that fits into the nightly news right. package or whichever news package you're putting it into. How often do you find, especially with stories around, about heroin addiction or the opioid epi epidemic and right. transgender children that... There are so many facets and so many layers that you, you know, you're, you're, you're worried that justice isn't being done to the story because of well, the format. Well, but that's the beauty of doing, in both those cases, we did series of stories. So we were, while they were only each one, they were longer than a usual piece. I think they were four minutes or so. And they were on the Today Show as well and Nightly News. Um, but we did a series. So I did six pieces on uh, that week on, um, on heroin. And you're able... I know it probably sounds silly, though. It's compared to, you know, sitting and reading a book on something or a magazine-lengthy piece. It is different. It is a different art. But you're able to really convey, I think, you know, people's stories. It's, it's amazing what we can do in a short amount of time when we really 
curate and really, you know, spend the time to investigate something and to really dig dig deep because that's part of the I think the challenge and the 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 challenge that we have and if we do it well the success that we have in television news is that we have to take complicated subjects and synthesize and we have to make it understandable for everybody out in the real world in the audience. Now, I, I, you know, you you are a television journalist. Uh, our president elect is obsessed with television news. He has well, he's obsessed with Twitter. On Twitter, he talks about his obsession with television news it's true. as well. And you are, in many ways, I mean, you adhere to these sort of old school uh, journalism models, which is you are an objective journalist. You are trying to seek the truth in objection, That's right. right, in being objective. Yet, many on his side or on the right side or even him think that any kind of criticism of him is being uh, biased, is right. being biased or even fake news at this point. A conversation was started about fake news in terms of actual fake stories, made up stories being disseminated out into the world and being used to sort of trick voters into swinging one way. Yet now any kind of criticism about president-elect is also being referred to as fake news. Yeah, no, I get, you look at my Twitter feed if you want. I don't look at it, but I get every day after my show or during my show on MSNBC and on Sunday Nightly, we, we get a fair amount of you know, people saying, you're just, you're just fake news. You're just, you're not. It's, it's. Listen, we are in. For my industry, we are in. I think at a a pivotal moment in time where. Well, just not to interrupt. Yeah. I just want to say, but your industry is news. Yeah, so if I'm you, talking about my. Yeah, I'm talking you, about journalism. If you are in a pivotal time. Yeah. We. Everybody. Are in a pivotal everybody. time. Everybody. Exactly. You know? Yeah, I think um, there's been a lot of soul searching after the election. I mean, clearly all the polls and all the predictions really weren't accurate for whatever reason. I mean, we, I think I have my own theories. I think that part of it is the, where we're based, the fact that, that you know, we're based in New York and LA and Chicago and Miami. We have bureaus all over the country, but they're in cities. And I think that maybe if there's a fault of us in, this, in, the, in the covering of the election, maybe it's that we collectively, the media, didn't get out you know, we didn't go to where my parents live in central Pennsylvania enough, okay? So there's that. Separately, there's the job that you asked me about that I do every day, day in and day out, which is to ask critical questions. You saw a little bit of it on MSNBC. I'm constantly trying to ask whoever is sitting in front of me the critical question. So it doesn't matter if they're a Democrat or a Republican or a dog catcher. I'm going to ask the most kind of pointed questions that I can and try to kind of play devil's advocate and just get at, as you said, get at the truth. That's what I see my role as. I am not an opinion journalist. Other people are. That's not me. My job is to try to lay out the facts for our viewers and let the viewers decide what they think about something. That's not my job to tell people what to think. But that in itself, what I just described, is being maligned right now. Yeah. I mean, just the role of being a fact checker and looking for truth and asking tough questions, for some isn't they, they don't like the answers and so they're they're not happy with us. And I get that, and I'm a big girl, we can take it. We we can all in my industry, my well, profession. Of anybody who's a public figure and anybody in life should be able to take criticism. But we're not talking about criticism here. We are talking about the dismantling of I hope not objectivity. Well, we better not be talking, or we're all in trouble. We, we, we better all be standing up for the power of freedom of speech and a free press in this country. Because if we lose that, we're in trouble, right? I mean, we, yeah. I think we could all agree that it is important to have people who hold other people accountable, who hold people in power accountable. And again, whether it, whatever the administration is, that's our, that's our role. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it scares me a little bit that, that, that people are judging us so harshly right now as a collective, as a whole. And if you meet us individually, it's funny, when I meet people individually, they'll be like, oh, you're a good person, you're a nice person. Yeah, I am. And, and you know, the, well, the, media the reputation we're getting is, I think, very unfair right The now. media has been made into a kind of um, evil Punching celebrity bag. figure, mm -hmm. you know, in the Punching sense. Punching bag. A punching bag. I mean, I would I would refer to the the media as the way that a lot of people looked at, unfortunately, like Lindsay Lohan when she was going through her worst train wreck episode, which is like everybody wanted to criticize her, thought that she 
thought that she thought that she was special and could get her, get get away with whatever she wanted and didn't relate to anybody else. Yeah, so I see that. She can I be our that. punching bag. And people think that people who work in the media or in any kind of industry outside of their bubble, this is my opinion, guys, not Kate's, outside of their bubble is one that is solely working against or forgetting about them completely and doesn't yeah. care about them. And well, and I think that's a big part of what happened in this election, right, is if you, if you look at who... Um, and I'm going to generalize, but a lot of the folks that supported Donald Trump are people who feel disenfranchised, are people who feel like they got forgotten, and not just got forgotten, but were being looked down on or being judged as less than by the power elites on the coast, you know? I think there was that sentiment of, like, who do you, who do you think you are, you, you folks in Washington, judging me and thinking I'm stupid? I'm not stupid. I'll show you. I'm going to vote for change. So I think it's all kind of interrelated. The powers that be that pay higher taxes than them, and uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'll get it, I'll get into it. Um, you know, I, my last question about the the how people view the media right now, and I don't agree with this at all, but I'm curious how you feel about it, considering he is the chief advisor, senior advisor to Donald Trump right now, Stephen Bannon, who mm, is. I don't know him. You know, I, I'm I've not asking if you know him personally. No, um, no but you might think I I don't know. Uh, his philosophy is essentially that. All news, for the most part, or what is considered objective and truth is stemming from the New York Times. Like the New York Times, which he considers a liberal bastion of thought, I don't agree with this, is the thing that is the trickle-down news filter for everybody else, MSNBC down to NPR and everything. Well, I read the New York Times, but I read about, you know, 20 other newspapers every morning too, right. so I mean, but that's unfair. To have that as a sort of close voice to the president-elect, future president of the United States, who is also ranting about the media, how do you feel about that, that philosophy? Well, I do want to make one point, though. On the flip side, I mean, what a great time we live in, right? Because you can now, you know, my kids, I have a 14 and 11-year-old, and they can go on the Internet and find just about anything. I mean, we'll, you know, you, you guys know this. We'll sit at dinner and somebody will say, oh, what year did the whatever happen? And they'll Google it immediately. I mean, we can have whole conversations around information at our fingertips news stories at our fingertips. I think there is a plus side, a positive, to having so many sources for information. But I do think that somebody has to curate those sources and people need to understand that there are differences between a Breitbart News and the way that they, the way they do their job and the New York Times and, and NBC News. Um, I don't know what to think about his proximity to Donald Trump because I don't know the guy. I'm not going to judge him without knowing him. I mean, certainly we've had many, many guests on the air who've defended him, and we have many, many, many guests who've said this is a terrible, terrible thing that, that, you know, that he stands for something they don't believe in. When you set out to do your show every day, MSNBC mm -hmm. Live with Kate Snow, what is your main goal? What is your objective for the day? Informing people of, I mean, my goal is in that hour to give you everything you need to be an informed citizen and a little more. For example, today, I just, I literally just raced off the set because we end at four o'clock Eastern time and I got stuck in traffic getting here, sorry, um, <laughs> Manhattan. Um, no, but today we had, um, we decided this morning not just to cover the kind of stuff that was happening at Trump Tower today, transition meetings, and there was a big tech summit today with a lot of tech leaders. A picture of Bezos, yeah, and Cook, Bezos, yeah. and, and a whole bunch of them were at. Um, Sandberg was there. Tim Cook was there, which which had to be interesting, right? Because remember, Donald Trump was like bashing Apple back in January and said, "You remember this?" He was like, yes. "They've got to move their production back to." What did he, he said something like, uh, their damn computers got to be made or their damn phones have to be made here in this country. Anyway, so you wonder what they talked about. Um, but that was one thing. We, we covered everything that was happening today, but we also wanted to do a little more. Um, we wanted to deep dive a little on two things that had just happened. A uh, new interior nominee was named. So we, I talked to a guy who's the head of, I'm not going to get his title right, but he's the head of a, of a hunting and angling fishing group, national group, uh, and he's from Montana, and he knows uh, the person who's the Interior Secretary nominee, and so, Zinke is his name, so right. anyway, we did that, and we, 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 we really got deep into, like, what does it mean for public lands? What's it going to mean for our national parks? And then the next segment was about energy, and Rick Perry from Texas, the former governor of Texas, who's now, who once wanted to dismantle the energy department. He couldn't even remember the name no, of the couldn't. department when he, he wanted couldn't. to dismantle it. Right. 
That's right. He was listing off three that he wanted to dismantle, and for people and I can't, who I can't remember. Didn't I can't see do it. it. He forgot. Can't remember it. But he wanted to get rid of it, and now he's going to be made the head of energy. And what does that mean? What what kind of philosophy does he have? I mean, like in the in the nitty gritty, what is he going to be able to do? What is he going to be controlling? We talked about how you know. He comes from Texas, where he actually, small fact that people don't know, he actually brought in wind farms. He actually did do a lot of stuff with renewable energy. So, and But then environmentalists are criticizing him for lacking environmental regulation on oil and gas. So well, Many have said that all, all the people that the president-elect is bringing in to run these agencies are those who have spoken about dismantling it in the past. Yeah, well, there's a trend. He's bringing in outsiders. He's yeah. bringing in people who want to shake things up, and that's what he's all about. But you asked me what we try to do on our show, and that's those are just two, a couple examples. I also had a segment on Star Wars, the new movie, today. Have you seen it yet? No, and I'm dying to see Rogue One. Has anybody seen it yet? I don't think no, so. I've seen not. 25 I mean, starts, minutes of it. Yeah, it starts on um, previews tomorrow night, and then Friday is the opening. Are your kids excited to see oh it? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> my daughter, especially, is a huge Star Wars fan. Enormous Star I mean, she what's has, your like, What's your favorite Star Wars? Favorites. Well... I loved last year. I mean, I lo The Force Awakens. I was just, I think it's my age. It was so nostalgic for me. Oh, it was nostalgic for everybody. But I would say the first trilogy. I mean, the well, I consider it the first. The first one that came out, Star Wars, uh, Return Empire of the, and, uh, Empire Strikes uh, Back, Return of the Jedi. Jedi. Those would be, those three would be, and I think Star Wars, the original Star Wars, the first, is my all-time favorite. But again, pretty incredible. But that's because I was, however, you're, you know, I was like ten. I don't know how old I was when that came out. I'm always curious about this when it when it when it comes to uh, anchors uh, and on air talent because I do this too and I'm always fascinated. Were when you went to college when you started studying, did you want to be a journalist or did you want to be an anchor? Neither. Neither. What did you want to no. be? A uh, professor. You wanted to be a professor. <laughs> well. You have to know that. Question, in, in which year of college, which professor turned you <laughs> off of that? Did you walk in and go, I don't want to wear a corduroy jacket? No, and no, a no, no. no ho before you start dissing professors, you have to I understand that my father is a professor, recently retired from Penn State. My diss of professors was meant in total jest. I love. <laughs> He's and that's not because you're dead. Like I went to college. <laughs> anybody who te anyone who's who's a teacher and is a, does yeah. a decent job at it, I salute you. You are a hero. Um, no, my my dad's a professor archaeologist, and so oh I, God, archae no, sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so I had this uh, I had this love of writing, and I really loved writing, and I loved language, and I lo I, I I knew that I wanted to do something where I would write uh, going into college. I thought I would study kind of the communication in terms of like the science of communication and the way people interact and communicate more. Like linguist sort of thing? No, more like sociology, more okay. like a social science, right? So that was my going in. And then this is what happened. Freshman year, there's a poster in the dorm and it says, um, come down to WVBR, the off-campus radio station. Uh, I went to Cornell. VBR is Voice of the Big Red. And, but it's off-campus. It's a commercial station. And so my, my dorm mate and I, Monica, were like, oh, let's go to this meeting. I'll play some music. I'll be a radio DJ. That was my thinking. We walk in, and they're like, no, 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 we don't really need music people. We need news people. So I kind of fell into sophomore year of college going out and covering, like, city council meetings and car crashes, and that was it. <laughs> city that council was it. meetings and car no, crashes. No, I mean, <laughs> and more, but yeah. I loved it. I loved it writing up stories and telling stories and and then being on the radio I was uh, by senior year I was hosting the morning drive um, news program you know the news cut-ins basically and how has your approach to telling the news and telling stories changed and adapted over the years as you've gone from oh, so radio much. to TV to to a live cable news show well and d don't forget digital I mean yes. what are we doing right now uh, every everything about the way we do the news has changed over the tw last 20 years. Um, I mean, I guess you're asking my personal journey because I started in radio and then I uh, got this a TV job, but I was originally behind the scenes. I was a producer booker um, for CNN. It was my first job out of graduate school. Um, and then I went to local news in New Mexico, which was a whole different thing, you know, running around as a, it was a one-man band. So I would like lug the gear, find the stories. Oh yeah, shoot the story, edit the story, and then like I would I would walk out. I'd be in a field and I'd like set up a light stand, 
And then I'd go over, kick the light stand down, and stand there and shoot pictures of myself. Does that, that make is sense? A, yeah, that makes that's amazing. <laughs> because there were no iPhones. There were no cell phones. I mean, there were no, you couldn't just like right. broadcast from your phone. You had to have a camera, like a big camera. How long did you do that? Uh, three years. And then you went and from then, there to New York? No. Are you joking? No, <laughs> no. There's a lot of steps in between. No, I went from, uh, well, that's just because you can't go from Albuquerque to New York. That You can, I guess, but nobody, you kind of have to be in, more incremental. I went from Albuquerque to Atlanta, uh, where I worked at a division of CNN, um, long story, and then DC, and then New York. And that's like the, the, the process generally of like being, of, of yeah, other talent a lot. or an I mean, anchors, right? Yeah, I always tell young people there's no one route to getting to where I'm sitting now. There's a million ways to do it. It's not like, you know, you go to law school, I guess you get some summer internship and then you know you're gonna be on the path to partner. It's not like that. It's very unpredictable and sort of, but for good and for bad, it's also awesome because you can make your own path, you know? When you reached a certain point at NBC where you were on nightly news and, and you, uh, you have your, your, your live show on MSNBC, did you reach a point where you're like, okay, now I can really pitch the stories that I wanna tell and I can, I can go about this a certain way? That's an interesting question. I think, you know, I think in any career, the more you do it and the more um, credentials you have, the more power you have to make decisions and kind of influence things. I still have a whole bunch of bosses who are, you know, producers and executive producers, senior producers, who it's a collaboration. I don't get to dictate even what's on my show on MSNBC every day. I don't get to dictate that, right. and certainly not. You uh, get to come into the open oh, but I meeting. but I get to yeah. I have some influence, and 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 I did reach a point, I, maybe like ten years ago, where I felt like I had a little more say. Um, but I've had a lot of different kinds of jobs. So when you're covering a beat, for example, like when I covered the White House, which I did, there's not a whole lot of flexibility. You're covering the White House every single day, you know? Um, you don't really get to go do a heroin series. But when I came to NBC, as I said before, I had a little, I, I came in as a long form person. So I had a little more leeway in pitching things. And to this day, I'm still pitching. I was, I was meeting with some Dateline people yesterday, pitching something for next year. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, before I turn it over to the audience for questions, you know, I, I wonder early in the conversation we're talking about remaining objective uh, mm -hmm. as, as a journalist uh, when you're at MSNBC, when you're on air. And I'm wondering how difficult that becomes sometimes, especially in the election that we just had, where it is hard not to have an opinion and want to use your opinion to educate, depending on, yeah. no matter which side that, that you're on. No, no, I hear you. I think it's interesting. I was just asked, one of our interns right now asked me this same question yesterday. So I'm and basically an intern. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. I, I think that because I started 20 years ago, I think I have a different perspective than people that maybe started just a couple of years ago. Because 20 years ago was a very different time. I started to touch on this a minute ago. You know, think about it. You had three network newscasts. CNN was sort of barely around when I was first starting out. There really wasn't a lot of, there certainly weren't cell phones and Twitter and social media and all these places to kind of, with, with opinions spewing out at you all the time, right? Now I think we live in a world where everybody's judging everybody else including me, on, well, what does she really think, you know? Like, we're all sharing so much about ourselves that we expect that everybody has some kind of bias. When I started 20 years ago, the idea of being a journalist was the Peter Jennings old school, you're there to report. The Walter Cronkite old school, you know, you're there to ask questions and report. It doesn't matter what you think, so you wall that off. You push that aside, and you, as best you can, and Did that become me. more difficult, though, in the age that Not we live in? Not for me, but I do think that people entering now maybe have a little bit of a different, it's, it's like there's a different feel now because there are so many opinion people and because everybody, you know, even a 23-year-old who's entering the business now has been on social media for the past 10 years of their life, you know, since they were 13, writing what they thought. You, Consist you see what I mean? Consistently getting validation for their yeah, opinion with exactly. likes all the time. And for me, I got validation all these years for, for just being a straight reporter. And so that's how I do it. I don't know any other way. Right. Um, so it hasn't become more difficult for me personally, but I do think I feel things, the way the, the audience processes and judges us is changing. 
And I've wondered, so you, so you say, you know, you say 20 years, right? Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. I'm 47. I have no problem with um, that. You know, I'm, I'm 32 and... It's actually 22 years. 22 years? Yeah. <sighs> no. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I'm 32, and this election for me, I don't have to remain objective, so I'm just going to be honest with you. This yep. election for me has been absolutely heartbreaking, just devastating. I right. am terrified. I'm worried that we're moving into a world that, like, I, you know, I'm worried about having kids kind of stuff, you know? But then also I think back, Bush was elected president. And was the left as worried, or people on the left as worried as I am right now? And then before that, there were the paleo conservatives like yeah. Pat Buchanan. Was it as crazy sounding when they were on the news? You know, in and my, people had to remain objective it, well, then as well. In my lifetime, in my career, I don't remember another election this filled with vitriol, anger, opposing points of view, and again, everybody sharing it widely. Um, on both sides, I don't remember so much. I mean, I have all kinds of friends who have lost their Facebook friends. Have ha I have? I know a family that you know split up and couldn't get together at Thanksgiving because they're so angry at each other. And I don't remember that sort of animus in in previous elections. I mean, it was 2000 was rough. I covered the recount down in Tallahassee, Florida, and that was it was tough. People were angry on both sides and there was there was a lot of tension. And people so worried it's like about a Republican and a Democrat like, you know, Yeah, we, but remember people worried about the future I and mean, people worried like is our democracy going to survive this whole recount, butterfly ballots and chads and all that stuff. So there was there's been concern before, but I do think that this it feels different to me. Um, you know. I guess the question is uh, is more so when I ask, is it difficult to remain objective? Yeah. Is the time that we're living in actually that different for a journalist who wants to remain objective? Or was it just as difficult 20 years ago when you had like a, a, a Pat Buchanan and paleo conservatives and you had militia movements in Michigan and in the mid 90s and you had Newt Gingrich railing against Clinton and trying to lock down the government to stop anything from going through? Or you know, is it actually the same? And I'm just now coming of age a little bit. Well, and you're also pointing out things that would anger Democrats and liberal people. So you're making an yeah, assumption yeah, I mean, about what the media is, which I ooh, actually you're right. I think did. is kind of unfair because we are a mix. We are, we really, if you like went through the NBC newsroom and polled people, if they could secretly tell you, you know, deep down what their, their parents were or what, how they were raised, it's more mixed than you think. You're absolutely right um, that I did that, and I thank you for right. calling me out on but, that. But um, I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I, I Here's the thing. I think the hardest part of my job is not being objective in the face of someone that I maybe in the back of my head you know, don't think much of. I think the most difficult part of my job is emotion and containing emotion and that's actually harder in the human stories that I've told. In the story where I'm sitting with the first Sandusky victim to tell his story, told it to me on, on TV, and it was heartbreaking. I mean, I'm a mother, it was, I, I can't even begin to tell you guys how awful that was sitting, and I started crying, and we had to stop tape because you're so emotional. Newtown, a year ago, uh, not a year ago, several years ago today, right, or yesterday, yeah, I think it was. I think it was today, actually. Yeah. Um, Maybe yesterday. I'm not sure. Driving up there, and I was the first person on scene for NBC, and we knew that it was little kids, and I'm getting text messages on my phone from my own kids' school, because I live I live in Westchester County, outside of New York, and my texts come saying our school's on lockdown too, because all the schools around Newtown went on lockdown, and that was horrifying and terrifying and, and I'm worried about my own but I'm also can't believe what I'm about to cover and these families, I'm, we pulled into town and people are running down the street in tears, I mean, and trying to keep my composure and do the news that night and stand and just talk like this was really hard. So to me, that's the harder part of the job. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's open it up to the audience for questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to go, I did not mean to... <laughs> Call everyone. No, it's okay. Media. No, it's. I mean, everybody. It was such a. Everybody assumes that. That would have been a, a moment where Stephen Bannon would have been clapping for me, and I'd been like, "Oh, you got me." <laughs> Questions. Hey, Kate. Um, Hi. You're much cooler than actors and singers. 
Thank um, you. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering, you're speaking about objectivity and stuff, and how does that, how do you think that plays into the push for like search engines and social media networks to censor our news more? Um, what, how do you mean? Like, do you think that's a good do you mean like Facebook and, and Google and, and things sort of like censoring fake news? Yeah. But do you yeah. mean the companies? Because I, I, I mean, from what we've reported, there, there's algorithms involved, right? And Facebook has explained that they don't, they did not intentionally try to skew your news feed. But I do think what happens is, and you guys would know this, you all look like you're a lot younger than me, you would know this better than me. I think we all self-select right so we end up in a bubble in a echo chamber because I, I shouldn't say we i i only have a facebook page that is public that is my like public persona it's called a fan page that's all i have i don't have the kind that you guys have where you friend each other and stuff so i i don't do this but i know that my family they like and they friend you know the people who are kind of like-minded and so you end up well, the algorithm ends up getting built off of it's, things that you like right, and exactly. stay on longer. I mean, longer. this does happen to me when I like click on a pair of boots that I like, then the next day I've got all these boots ads, right? And so there's all these algorithms at work, and I think that that, I actually do think that that's part of the issue right now, is that people aren't going outside their zone, their bubble, to see what's being written over here, you know? And so social media is kind of allowing you, everybody, to stay in their own bubble I, if I could tell younger generation one thing, it would be read something from someone that you completely disagree with. You know, just. It's so hateful sometimes. <laughs> but isn't it better you're to right. be widely you're informed right. than to just be narrowly looking only at the people that you agree with? 100%. Still not gonna dig into Breitbart <laughs> that often. Uh, next question. Okay, thank you for being here. Um, yeah. What were some of your favorite journalistic idols growing up? Uh, journalistic, sorry, icons? Idols. Idols. <sighs> There's a bunch. Um, it's funny, I, well, I always admired Matt Lauer, and then I started, then I worked with him, and so it was kind of weird, you know? That went away. really be no. a fangirl when you're working with someone. Um, I really, really admire Diane Sawyer, and I worked with her also for a time at ABC. Um, I admire Barbara Walters just for the, her ability to ask questions that you don't expect, right? She's always, she makes everybody cry. I mean, she's always kind of going in for the, you know, emotion. And I just think she's a very talented interviewer. Um, Charlie Gibson, who worked with me at ABC, is still a friend and a mentor, was really a mentor to me. Um, and then there's people, there's people behind the scenes. There's a woman named Gail Evans, who was my boss at CNN, who was the first vice president I believe, of any news organization who was a female. And she hired me at the age of 23. That first job that I had when I was a booker and producer was under Gail Evans. And she had a whole bunch of us. We were all like first-time job people, you know, in our 20s, mostly women. I don't know if that was on purpose, but she had a lot of us who she encouraged and mentored. And she's a really big part of why I took a huge chance. I'm, I'm, I have this job. I'm 23, and I'm in Atlanta, and I'm at CNN behind the scenes. And I had worked in radio prior. And at some point I thought, maybe I could go out and work in local news and really be on TV, because I had never been on the camera side. And she encouraged me, and quick story, I made a hundred or so tapes, and back then it was tapes. There was no, <laughs> you couldn't just send a clip, right? <laughs> there was no like emailable, you know, or like downloadable clip. So I sent, physically sent these tapes in manila envelopes to like a hundred stations and I got three job offers. That was it, 97 rejections, and... Three out of 100 is pretty good. I mean, it's okay, right? Yeah. It's okay. It was um, Helena, Montana, where I would have made the same amount that my brother was making that summer making pizza. So I was like, mm, I don't think I can do that. I had student loans, you know. Um, and the Albuquerque job, which really wasn't Albuquerque, it was Carlsbad, New Mexico. It was a bureau of Albuquerque that I started in. Oh, yeah. I like the closest, specifics here. Closest mall is two and a half hours away. <laughs> closest airport, two and a half hours away. Um, and then the third one was uh, Columbus, Georgia. And I was living in Atlanta, so that was attractive because it was close by. But you went to Al New Mexico. Al 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 New Mexico mm -hmm. one. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. 
Hi, Kate. Hi. Um, so going back to the Sandy Hook, but today being the four-year anniversary, I live just minutes away from the school. I can't believe it's been four. I was trying to think, is it yeah. three years or four years? Yeah, four it's, years. it's crazy. Like, it still doesn't leave you. No. And um, I was just curious, like, from a journalist's point of view, I know the day when it was happening, I was watching all the live coverage, and I remember sitting with my best friend. I, we were, like, three days out from, you know, being home from college. Yeah. And she said to me, she said something like, you know, I can't believe all these journalists would just rush in so quickly, let people, you know, you know, do their, th you know, you know, handle it on their own yeah. and let, you know, come in later. So I'm just curious from your point of view, like, how do you feel about, I guess, the immediacy of Yeah, it's doing hard. It's really hard because you have to, I had to go and I had to be there because somebody had to be there to tell the story of this horror that happened. But you don't want to be there. As a human being, you feel terrible. And what I, the way I deal with that is to be, just as I'm being right now, just be a human being. And I walked up to people and said, I'm so dreadfully sorry to be here. I don't want to be here, but I have to be. And will you please, you know, tell me what happened to you? Or, or would you let us? I remember there was a guy at a church, and we asked if we could use his bathroom because we were dying. We needed a bathroom. And, and he said, yeah, you know, you can come in. And, and, I mean, it was just we were human to human. We were just person to person, you know. I think, I think sometimes we all... I don't know, we judge each other and we forget that we're all the same, we're all humans at heart and we're not trying to trample on your lawn or be horrible people, we're, we're trying to do what we have to do. But that said, I know at the time NBC made a decision after about two days, um, it's happened on a Friday, and by like Saturday night or Sunday morning we just, we pulled out everything except for one person on purpose because it, we felt that it was, my bosses made the decision that it was too much for us all to be there. So there is, there's always that balance. Um, but you can imagine if nobody had gone, then, the, then, then their children might not have been remembered in the way that they were. So that's, I guess, what I always come back to is somebody has to tell the story of those children and, 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 and the story about, you know, that horrible person who did what he did and how did he get those guns and where did he get you know those stories have to be told it brings up a, like what i've always seen is the big the, bi the biggest yin and yang of sort of working in news which is that you have to cover the tragedies yeah. you have to talk about them you have to be there you have to report on them but at the same time while it's noble that it's your job it's also your job so if you do an amazing job at it and it boosts your profile and gets you promoted or something that's just so crazy yeah. and weighs on you so heavily like how, how how do you sort of contend with that at times that's a good question i i mean i remember I, when i was when i was just i have a lot of post-traumatic post stress to be honest i mean there's you know really there's I, a lot of things that i've covered that have really affected me um and 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 yeah it's it's ironic it's ironic isn't even enough of a word it's it's horrible that like you cover the Haiti earthquake. I covered the earthquake in Haiti, and that's some of my best work. Yeah, and it's bec because something horrible happened, and it was horrid tragedy that they killed so many people. Um, but but, but it's, it's, it's sort of it's like maybe like maybe akin to being a doctor, and you lose some patients, but maybe you're able to try out a new procedure that is life saving later. So that's how I look at it is along with those horrible stories come the amazing, heartwarming, wonderful stories that I've done and been able to do because we do the horror stories too. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing to, to, to frown upon as a viewer or watcher of news. It was always something I was fascinated with when I was doing news a little bit more at HuffPost Live, which was just sort of like if I did something, if I had to cover a tragic story and afterwards everyone was like, amazing, you did a great job. Yeah. You're kind of like, oh, yeah. I, okay. You know, it's that weird feeling of like, what is, is, is the, what's the purpose sometimes, you know, or what is my end drive, end goal, you know? Hopefully it's just to give informing. voice. It's informing, you know, yeah. if we're not, you know, if we're not there, um, I'm trying to think of other examples, you know, it's like if a tree falls in the woods and nobody sees it. Yeah. Um, 
Well, when it comes to informing, you know, you're one of our best. And I thank you so much for being here. Yeah, this was so fun. It was wonderful to have you. Thank you for letting me You didn't pick, ask me any tough questions. I, th I was expecting, like, really tough questions. The one tough question I asked, you you picked me apart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. Did I? No. I was so happy to have happen. Thank you. <laughs> it made me feel really better, a lot better about news in the world. Thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. Your show, MSNBC Live with Kate Snow, is uh, every weekday at every four? Every weekday. Three. 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 Excuse me. That's okay. MSNBC. Three o'clock Eastern, and I'll just say noon. Pacific, because a lot of people watch us at lunchtime on the West Coast. And you uh, also nightly anchor news. the nightly news every Sunday, Every right? Sunday night, 6.30 in most markets, 5.30 in the middle of the country. Kate Snow, thank you so much thank for being you. here. Such a pleasure having you. Thank you.